Everyone. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Robin uh, here from Teach, and today our guest is Kim Kizito, uh, the IP strategist on TikTok um, and who does amazing things on TikTok. Uh, love her content. Kim, I'll let you introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, all that good stuff. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I am Kim Kizito, um, and I am the IEP strategist. What is an IEP strategist? I have no idea. I got tired of being called an advocate, so I came up with my own thing. Um, but basically, I am a parent advocate. So what I do is I teach parents how to navigate the school system for their kids with disabilities. And I also work with companies that have uh, social workers, mental health professionals that also advocate for families that have disabled kids. So that would be the foster care system or um, adoption system. And I do training there as well. Awesome. So Kim is here to talk to us a little bit about the basics of the IEP process, rights. Um, and so I'm going to disappear for a little while, but as you're watching. Don't leave me, Robin. <laughs> um and we uh, will do a q a so you know keep the comments lively you can put your questions there um as kim is talking um and then we will get to them at the end um so i'm going to disappear now and i'm going to uh, leave you to to it <laughs> all right guys so i'm going to give you guys some some uh what do you call it um housekeeping rules and that I'm actually going to give those to Robin because I have never done StreamYard. I've done webinars on other things, but I cannot see the comments. And I think that's by design, because if I do, I am also an adult that has ADHD. Um, so I will stop and just start focusing on the comments. So at any point in time, Robin can jump in and say, hey we should focus on this or we should move along or something like that. And I've already told her this, but I'm just reminding her. So um, quick, I actually became an advocate because I have a uh, two daughters. One is autistic and ADHD and has um, anxiety and she is 15. And then my youngest daughter who is eight is pretty profoundly ADHD. And so I kind of got into this whole thing by going to an IEP meeting and feeling like, so I don't know like what I'm supposed to do and like nobody's telling me and you know, they're like, oh, you're an equal part of the IEP team and I just didn't feel like it. And so I just kind of fell backwards into advocating when I hired an advocate that ended up hiring me um, a couple years later. So I think it's really important to understand this process. So I'm going to go into my little presentation and every uh, once in a while, I'll go into my little Southern accent. Um, and again, if Robin is seeing any issues with uh, screens or pictures or whatever, she's going Kim, to just the only let thing me I, know. Kim, the only thing I see is I see that window that says audience window. This is what your audience sees. And then I have a button oh, to enter full screen mode. So you just have to like, I guess either close that window or. Close the window. Okay, guys. Hmm. And it only came up, Robin, when you um, <laughs> when I shared it. Oh, and now Canva's asking me to rate their experience, my experience. Okay, guys, very bad. Pay, pay no attention to this part, guys. This is this is not the part that you need to see. That's all good. Okay, let me just do the presentation view. Yeah, you got to share it again. All right, I'm gonna share. Okie dokie. When you shared it the first time, I didn't see that. So it's probably just. Yeah, well, you know, this is, this is how life works over here. In the it is. We're world. flexible. <laughs> We're flexible thinkers. Oh, well, that's interesting. Hmm. Will that be it? Okay, let's click there. Let's see if that does it. Is that doing anything? <laughs> I see your whole. I see your whole. You're thing. seeing my whole thing. Yeah, you just got to make it big. Like it's like the full screen. I like, just want everyone to understand that. Um, this is Robin's fault. <laughs> as long as everybody knows that we're throwing fault. me under the bus. Uh, all right, hold on, Kim. I'm gonna add it, but I yeah, there you go. Perfect. You're all good. All right. 
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna remove myself now, and I'll let you get to it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I have some objectives. Um, if you follow, uh, if any of you are on TikTok, you'll understand why I say "poof, be gone" um, <laughs> to Robin. But I, just some objectives. So we, we may or may not get through all of this in an hour. I happen to do a lot of talking, which is why I'm giving Robin permission to just kind of tell me to move along. But I want to. I want the uh, you also have a general understanding. Even if you have a child on an IEP, they're a senior in high school, and you know there are some things that you did not know. I really want parents to understand how the how these things go. So we're going to be going through the child find process. I'm just going to explain some of the things that are required by the federal government in order for um, your child to have a free, appropriate public education. So that is exactly what that second term is under the second bullet, talking about the describing the meaning or defining the meaning. FAPE stands for Free Appropriate Public Education, and every child is entitled to it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about some of the categories of special needs under the idea. And um, more importantly, how schools look at those categories in reference to education and what education is in the idea and how schools use those that information to determine whether or not your child is going to get services. Um, one would think that a child that is disabled and has one of these thir one or more of these 13, 13 categories would get all of the services that the public school has to offer, which would mean I would not have a job. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. So we're going to talk a little bit about state specific stuff. And um, I want you to really get an understanding of how to manage your child uh, throughout the years, throughout the IEP years. So we're going to talk a little bit about child find again, child find. A lot of times people think about child find and they think about um, little kids. But child find is in effect in every state, all 50 states from birth until 21. And then some states will specify age 22, 23. But basically what child find is, it states that the states are responsible for finding all children in those age ranges from birth to 21 that have a disability or a suspicion of a disability and determining whether or not those kids need special education. Where do we find child fine? Well, we find child fine in something called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is IDEA. So we're going to go over that. That's in the next slide. But it's a legal requirement. So what that means is if you're, you're sitting in your home and you have a child that could possibly have a disability, your school district is responsible for finding that child. Now, how are they going to find that child? Are they going to come knocking on your door? No. <laughs> However, every state has to outline exactly what processes they're going to go through to find those children. And so you can just do a little bit of digging. I just happened to be looking at Michigan earlier today and they have their outline shows that they put in um, ads in their newspaper. They listed on their school website. They partner with doctors and daycare, pediatricians and daycares and things like that to see whether or not there are uh, possible issues with children that could have one of these qualifying disabilities. And so it basically requires these school districts to find these kids. And a lot of times we just kind of, because I have the trained eye and I'm looking for it, I'll just be looking on a school's website and I will see if you have a child that possibly has a disability, call this person. And so it's really interesting to see how that works. And if you look at it again, most of the people that are listening may not be thinking about these kids that are infants, but child find does include infants and toddlers. These are called early intervention programs. And so in many states, we will call that zero to three or birth to three or something like that, where if you are a parent and you're home with your toddler or your daycare tells you that there's something going on and maybe the child is displaying some sort of symptoms of a disability or maybe they're developmentally delayed or something, you can call your state Typically, it's your Department of Health and Human Services, and they will send someone to your home to assess that child to determine, based on the state standards, whether that child meets the criteria in order to receive early intervention. So, but what happens if your kid's not in public school? 
so again, we think about IEPs and we think about 504s and we only think about public school. The state has the, is mandated to find every child. So if your child just happens to be going to homeschool, if you happen to pay for a shishi poo poo private school, that those children are still included in this child find mandate. Meaning if there is an issue or a suspected disability with these kids while they're in these schools, you can, whether or not that child is going to the public school across the street or the private school two blocks down, you can still contact your public school to have that child assessed at the no cost to you. Now, I kind of say that tongue in cheek because no cost to you, you're paying taxes. So technically, <laughs> you're sort of paying for it at some point. But Another thing um, that I find out about child find that a lot of parents don't realize is schools will tell parents that, well, you know, we thought something was going on with, with Kim, but we never got a request from you to evaluate. So we just never did anything. So we're not at fault. Well, yes, they are. The law states that the parent or Anybody that is in what is called the LEA, the local education agency, can refer a child for testing. Local education agency means your school. So that would be the teacher, the uh, principal, the counselor, anyone that has a suspicion. And a lot of times these are where this is where these things are being picked up in the schools. Uh, you may have parents that just have no idea that there's a disability or perhaps the parent is, I don't want to say in denial. Um, there are, that's probably the best way I can say it. I, I'll speak to myself. I had a suspicion that my autistic child was autistic, but everybody was telling me, no, 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 she's not. <laughs> and so there was a certain part of me that did not have an understanding of autism 15 years ago and, you know, was in denial saying, well, I don't want that my child to have any sort of label or anything like that. And so when you go into the school districts or you take a child like that to school, the way my child was in school, a teacher could pick it up fairly easily. So teachers are allowed to refer. So I'm going to move on. We talked a little bit about what is the Individuals <clears throat> with Disabilities in Education Act. I refer to it as the idea because that's what it is, but it's the law. And when I say it's a law, if you look at on the bottom there, it says it's, it's an administrative statute. So it's still a law, but parents will tell me, is the school breaking the law? You know, and so they really don't say they don't like to use those terms when they when the school is not following the, the administrative statute. We can't technically say they're breaking the law in the traditional sense. So don't go running up to the school with handcuffs just because the school didn't assess your child <laughs> properly. But it is a law. <clears throat> and a part of the, the biggest part of that law, one of the bigger parts of the law is child fine that we went over. The second part is that the uh, our government has promised that the purpose is to have our children receive a free, appropriate public education that is FAPE. And a lot of times, all parents need to do is use some of this terminology to let the school know that you're serious. So FAPE is something that is what is a kind of a special education term. And when you use that, the schools pretty much understand, okay, they have a little, they have a little bit of knowledge. We can't skip around here. We have to uh, stick to deadlines and things like that. Now, I sound a little bit jaded um, because by the time parents hire me, probably about 60% of the parents that hire me are hiring me because there's a problem. And so, yeah, I can get jaded. <laughs> so, But um, uh, maybe 40% usually are hiring me because they want to understand the process. But there's times where I'm really shocked at sometimes how the schools try to be a little bit sneaky. So if you hear that in my voice, you're getting that. But it doesn't mean that I'm talking about every school. And I certainly have had wonderful experiences with my own daughter's school, which is why I, I so um, have such high expectations for the school system. So the purpose and the idea came about in the 70s. OK, <laughs> 1975. It wasn't always called idea back then. Um, but 
prior to that, it was completely legal for a school district to take a kid like my kid and say, hey, I'm sorry, we just can't educate this kid. And, you know, she's got this autism diagnosis. We don't have the resources. And if you had a state or a district that did not provide funds for those types of kids, then guess what? She would be sitting right back at home with me, not getting an education or getting whatever it was that I could provide for her. And it's really interesting because right around the time that it was passed, I actually started kindergarten the year before. But when the idea was passed, there were schools that did not have any accommodations, any, uh, think about kids that maybe have um, issues with walking, there were no ramps, there, these were just not requirements at all. School buses, just all of that. I don't know what the age of the people are <laughs> that are listening, but you know, at, at, at my old age, these things just did not exist. And so when the idea passed, it said, hey, guess what? We now have this law that says, all of these public schools have to provide a free appropriate publication for a public education for every child. Yes, even that child, uh, Kimberly's daughter that's sitting at home with autism, we gotta, we gotta school her too. And so these schools districts were just like, are you kidding me? So because of right around the time that um, this was going on, we had, I wanna say about 4 million children that were not receiving any sort of education at all. Uh, another 4 million kids that were getting a marginal education, and then a couple million kids that were getting what they consider to be a pretty good education in the United States in the 70s. And so thinking about those numbers, all of a sudden, now we have to make space for these kids. And I just like to think about, you know, what, are, what were these principals and what were these superintendents thinking? And so the federal government are like, gosh, I've got to now have to have to figure out how to get um, these kids with uh, wheelchairs on the second floor or how are we going to get these kids uh, transported to school? And so the federal government says, OK, OK, fine, we will go ahead and give you up to 40 percent of federal funding for any kid that has an IEP, any kid that's that's uh, being serviced under IDEA. And whoever wrote that was genius because the term up to has been used ever since 1975 to not provide 40%. <laughs> so if you think about kids that have uh, that do not have disabilities and those kids who do have disabilities, so say you have those kids that are going to going to school, your real estate taxes, property taxes are paying a dollar for each of those kids to be able to attend school, and that dollar covers the building costs, the, you know, uh, salaries, so on and so forth. The idea for those kids that are in that school that all have an IEP is supposed to give another 40 cents for that, those kids to be able to provide salaries for special education teachers and um, assistive technology, all kinds of good stuff. However, our good old federal government has not fully funded the idea ever since 1975. The most the idea has ever been funded was 20%. And that was a few years ago. So uh, 2019, I believe we were at right around 13%. And I am waiting to see what the percentage numbers are for 2020 since we were in COVID. Um, but if you think about it, so now instead of $1.40 for every kid with an IEP, uh, we're right around $1.13. So 13 extra cents. And so when people are asking me, well, Kim, why, you know, what is it? Is it a money thing? It's, you know, these, these, don't they get paid and funded? Yeah, they get funds, but they've got to stretch those funds. So you imagine stretching 13 cents versus 40 cents per kid. It's a lot. And um, what I find schools doing is looking at the children that have what we consider hidden disabilities, um, as in lower, um, the kids that have low support needs and not wanting to recognize them for special education because that takes away dollars from some of the kids that have higher support needs. However, the law does not look at it that way. So it's just a little little um, political rant for you. <laughs> but under uh, in the section here, so basically what the idea also does is it's going to give you as a parent an understanding of the law for your child you get to provide input. The idea also gives you as the parent the recourse to um, have legal rights anytime the school says no or anytime you disagree with the school. So, But one thing we do want to know is that the idea doesn't mean every child with a, let's all pronounce this misspelled word together, diagnosis 
is, is eligible for special education services. So um, your lovely person that typed that, I'm going to blame that on me, who was the person that typed it. But for the most part, you need to be able to qualify. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But before we get to that, I want to go over what the idea considers um, a classification of a disability. So before the end of this, you will know that there are three things that a student has to have in order to receive services under the idea, which would mean to receive an IEP. And the first thing would be meeting one of these categories of special needs. And there are 13. So you can see what those are, autism, deaf and blindness, deaf blindness, deafness. Um, some of them are categorized, like you'd say, well, why isn't deaf blindness and deaf deafness? The states and the federal government figured out how to differentiate between the two. If you really, really want to know, um, what I would suggest you do is to go to your state's Department of Education, type in special education, and each state will explain what they define as these specific disabilities. And most of them pull their wording from the idea. Um, but the reason why I'm telling you to go directly to your state for that information is because your state is going to also give their minimum qualifications for determining who can assess, for instance, a child that has a suspicion of autism? Who can do the assessment for a child that has a specific learning disability and those types of things? So again, at the very bottom there, I say even with a diagnosis of love, you still may not qualify <laughs> under IDEA. So what happens a lot of the time, and this is one of the things that I went through, go to the doctor. Um, your child has been having issues in first grade, say. Say they're in first grade and they're they're reading is um the reading great their math is great but they're getting in trouble all the time they seem really distracted and somebody mentions adhd to you and you're just like oh, okay you know my husband has it but i don't know anything about it i gotta go to the doctor go to the doctor doctor says oh yeah little kimberly has adhd i'm little kimberly um <laughs> and you're like oh well, that's interesting okay well let's go to the school because i know that that's one of the things that kids can get help for. So I go and I take my diagnosis. I walk to the school and I'm like, hey, little Kimberly has ADHD. Can we go ahead and get services? And the school says, eh, nope, <laughs> because you need to have a few other things. So what happens all the time is parents will talk to me and they say, well, I've got an autism diagnosis, but we cannot get the school to provide services or they want to assess again. I don't understand. Well. I want you to look at it this way. What a doctor does, a doctor's diagnosed using something called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the DSM. And right now we are on version five. And what that does is it just has a list of uh, things that need to happen in order for that particular person to receive that particular diagnosis. So say you have a ingrow toenail or whatever, and the doctor has, has looked at your toes and are just like, okay, check, 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 you know, and I'm, I'm making it very simple, but I mean, you may have some other things which require a blood test or whatever. And yes, you indeed have an ingrown toe. I'm looking at my toe, like you guys are actually watching me look at my toe. Um, yes, you have an ingrown toenail. This is what we're going to do. We're going to diagnose you with ingrown toenail disease and what happens with the diagnostic statistical manual is that goes to another manual that assigns a code which is and some of you may know about icd-9 codes or um, diagnostic codes and those codes do what those codes go to your insurance company <laughs> <laughs> and your insurance company, it's, it's all set up. It's all together, folks. So your insurance company will say, oh, the diagnostic code for ingrown toenail is 529. And guess what? We don't cover that. So no, you got to pay for your doctor's appointment. But um, so that's, that is completely separate from what a school does. So you can take that diagnosis from the doctor of autism. And I believe the autism diagnostic code is 299. Um, and go to the school and they still need to do their own testing. Well, what is the school looking for? Let's go to the next slide. So how does a student receive services under IDEA? So again, we went to the first one. They have to have one of those 13 diagnoses. Do they have to have it in order to get 
services from the school. No, you need only to have a suspicion of the diagnosis. So I've been uh, an advocate for about 13 years, coming up on 14 years, and I have clients that do not have a medical diagnosis of autism. But when they get assessed by the school, they have what we like to refer to as an educational classification of autism or vice versa. I will have a child that has a medical diagnosis of autism, but does not meet the criteria in order to receive um, and the services under IDEA. So a lot of times you will hear the term educational diagnosis. That is a term I would like for you to stay away from if you're a parent, especially if you have not received services yet, because some schools, there's tricky words there. You do not want to say, I need you to give Kim a, her ADHD, meta, uh, autism, uh, ADHD and autism educational diagnosis. She's already got her medical diagnosis. And the first thing the school says, we can't do that. And then they send you on your way and you call me and I'm like, ah, you shouldn't have said diagnosis. Let's go back and say we want to have the child assessed. And then, boom, magically they do that. And then it's been two or three weeks and your kid has lost, you know, some time. And so I really like to make sure that our parents understand the right wording. So after that is number one. Remember, I said there's three things. So the school has to determine you have one of these diagnoses or a suspicion of one of these diagnoses. And number two, you need to have that diagnosis impede that child's education in some way, shape, or form. Now, what is education? Here's another big thing. Again, and this is stuff that, that I run into all the time. Education in the federal government, to the federal government, is the whole child. So that means multidisciplinary. That means behavioral, social emotional, and last but not least, academic. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and let that sink in. Because what I see happening a lot is schools will say, you know, Kimberly is just, you know, in addition to her being so beautiful <laughs> um, <laughs> and having this ADHD, she's really, really intelligent. You know, she's just not applying herself. And we did a, you know, she did this IQ test and her IQ is, is above average. So um, go back to that, the FAPE, the A in FAPE stands for appropriate. So as a parent, you can look at little Kimberly and say, well, I know Kimberly's capable of getting straight A's, but the public school system says, well, we don't have to make sure that she gets straight A's. We just have to give her an appropriate education. You want a straight A education um, to go and pay for your kid to go to private school. Now, they're not going to say that, but what they might say is, she doesn't need specially designed instruction because her grades are fine. She doesn't need an IEP because she doesn't have any issues with math or science or anything. She's Her grades are A's, B's, and C's. We don't understand why you're coming to us. And however, if you look at Kimberly's record, she has constantly getting in trouble, getting in detention because she's talking too much. She is looking out the window all the time. Uh, the teachers have no idea of how it is that she is pulling a C on the test because she clearly is not paying any attention in class. If you ask Kim's mother, she is taking two hours to do homework that should take 20 minutes. These are all things that should trigger a school to think, hmm, there may be something here that we can help with. And so what I find myself saying a lot to the schools is, that's great that this child has a wonderful IQ. That's great that this child is getting very good grades. However, we've only looked at one of those things. We've only looked at the cognitive, the intelligence. So I say cognitive, intelligence, academic, I kind of use all of those things hand in hand. But we haven't looked at her social skills. Did you notice that she goes and sits by herself at lunch every day? She doesn't have any friends uh, when she only talks to the adults. And when she does talk to the adults, she only talks about um, the top 40. Gosh, that is such an old term. She only talks about 80s music. <laughs> um, and or she only talks about zodiac signs or, or he only talks about um, elevators or something like that. So these are and then behavioral. Did you notice that she's 13 and, you know, a typical 13 year old behavior is when they don't get their way or when something changes is to just kind of sulk about it, but she's having meltdowns that are causing her to go to the office. Those are issues, okay? So we talked about social, we talked about emotional. She's unable to um, contain her emotions. 
and behavioral. Uh, did you notice that every time she goes to gym and they don't play the game that she wants, she is stomping up and down the stairs and throwing all of the, knocking over all the carts that have, that hold all the basketballs. Those are things that are not typical for a 13 year old. You know, that might be typical for a three year old, but these are things that the idea still considers education. When you have a child that is autistic, for instance, I'll use my own daughter as an example. Um, we have an expectation when our child enters kindergarten that they are at some point going to learn how to raise their hand, how to stand in line, how to sit down when the teacher says sit down. Um, and we just have that expectation. But those are things that are taught. And those are things that may not be a part of a curriculum. So you may look at a kindergarten teacher's curriculum and it does not say, today we're gonna to teach everybody how to stand up and sit down. But it is something that is taught in a different way. So it is taught by the kids are observing other kids and how they're behaving. And a child that is autistic may not pick up about those things. And if I speak about my child in general, she really is not paying attention to what the other kids are doing. And it would, these habits were not things that were she was able to pick up on. Um, another example would be watching, and I'm, I'm uh, speaking specific to autism, but uh, since I have one kid that's autistic and one kid that, that's not, my child was not, would walk by a telephone and not pick it up and put it to her ear. And, you know, we didn't have these kind of phones when she was, <laughs> was around, but she wouldn't pick it up and put it to her ear when she was six, seven, eight months. Whereas my eight-year-old by four or five months picked up a phone and put it to her ear. I didn't teach her that. I didn't sit her down and say, hey, let me show you how to use a phone. She picked up on that. And so what the schools are not always recognizing is some of the inherent learning things that kids that do not have a disability pick up on are kids that do have a disability aren't necessarily picking up on those things and do need specially designed instruction in order to learn those things. And so that I am giving a lot of education sometimes in the schools when they want to uh, kick back and say that they don't want to assess. So um, let's see. That second one. So the three things, so I, I technically don't have kind of the third thing there. So the, the three things, one would be to have one of those diagnoses. Two would be to have that diagnosis impede the education. So the easy one would be maybe a child has an intellectual disability and therefore it's going to impede their education, meaning they're not necessarily going to be grade level for any of their core subjects. Um, the less easy one would be the, the education, looking at the education in terms of the whole child being social, behavioral, emotional. How do they figure those things out? They do an assessment. And then the third thing would be once we determine whether that child has uh, the disability impedes their learning, and again, I'm talking about all learning, then they need some sort of specially designed instruction, some sort of related service. And by related service, I mean uh, speech therapy, um, occupational therapy, transportation, uh, that you don't necessarily have to need a related service, but those are the types of things that would say that a child needs that. So specially designed instruction also can be referred to as an individually individualized <laughs> education webinar. Program. I hear you, Robin. Are you Sorry, I'm still behind. Yeah, I'm back. I just wanted to, to pop on. It's 8.33 now. So All right. um, yeah, we could kind of like just focus on the identification stuff and get to some of the questions or like however you want to do it. But I just want to like have a little time. Okay. Uh, yeah, are you seeing questions? There's a ton of questions. So maybe, questions. Okay. maybe we want to do that. And then if you want to come back for a part two. <laughs> yeah, let me, I don't want to disappoint the people. The people <laughs> have questions. They're so. Uh, Let's answer some questions. I'm happy to answer some questions. So I'm going to put us like, it's uh, we're just us here. So I'm going to, what I can do is fancy, put the questions up here. Um, so ooh, look at this. Um, so <laughs> Beth says, so my daughter has an ASD diagnosis, but I'm thinking she will get an uh, ADHD diagnosis. Also, someone told me she will switch from her IEP to a 504 if this happens. Is this true? And which is better? Beth Bird. Hey, girl. Hey. 
No, it's not true. And you tell that someone that I said so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the only, um, well, first of all, in order to switch your child from an IEP to um, a 504, they would have to do a full evaluation all over again. Okay. So if she's had, if she just say she just had a, her evaluation. And when I talk about evaluation, I evaluation and assessment, I go back and forth. They're the same thing. Um, but that is where the school psychologist comes in and it, you know, takes them all those days and they have to, that would be considered a change of placement. And anytime the school is making a big change like that, they have to prove why. So they would have to say, well, she's got ASD. She has ADHD too now and we think that she has proven she's met all of her iep goals and right now all she needs is um accommodations which would be just like you know um, being able to take longer time on tests and things like that and so we can move her from an iep to a 504. i don't see that happening that often um and if the school is going to look at it that way, then you def and you don't want it to change, then they, they have to prove it. So uh, one thing that I tell parents a lot of the times is schools will make you feel like and if there's anybody in the schools, fight me. If you're on if you're a, a principal, fight me, we can fight over the thing. But schools will make you feel like you have the burden of proof. OK, mm -hmm. I am not an attorney. <laughs> My sister's one um, and I should have been. I make more money. But you really do not. The school has the burden of proof many times. And this will be a situation like that where they're just like, OK, well, we're going to put on our 504. Prove it. They have the burden of proof and the burden of proof, mean, meaning that they have to provide these peer reviewed, standardized tests. Um, Oh, what's the name of those tests, Robin? Not peer reviewed, but the norm, these norm IQ tests, tests norm, norm, reference, reference. Norm, norm, reference. norm reference tests in order to prove that your child's um, diagnoses no longer impede their education. And to give you another little uh, nugget there, Beth, uh, my daughter's 15. She has not had not been pulled for special education since first since kindergarten, but she has had an IEP and still needs an IEP. And her IEP is for um, social, behavioral, emotional. She gets straight A's. She's going to be in honors classes in a few weeks. But she still needs to, this is a kid who will um, pick her nose in front of you at 15. <laughs> so she still needs, you know, some, some behavior. Right. 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 And so and when people ask me which is better, um, the back of my mind always says IEP. <laughs> but... Um, and the only reason I say that is because of how schools use it. The, the correct answer, if things went the way they were supposed to, would be that neither one is better. It depends on what the child needs. So the biggest difference between an IEP and a 504 is specially designed instruction. OK, so whereas an IEP is going to say Kim Kizito has ASD and ADHD, we need to, based on what her testing shows, we see that she's got deficit, a deficit in math and in reading comprehension, and she needs um, to learn how to socialize because all she does is walk around by herself. We're going to design instructions specifically for her to help her meet the goals year after year. A child that does not need specially designed instruction, but may have a diagnosis that needs some uh, help would qualify for a 504. And a 504 is, I like to think of a 504 as providing access. So I'm still going to go to the same class. I'm still going to stay in that class all day, but I just happen to have a wheelchair and I need a 504 so that I can get to the second floor so I can use the elevator. Um, it's also going to provide me with the ability to leave the class maybe earlier because the hallways are crowded. Um, I may have ADHD and not need an IEP, but I might need a 504 because I have to have everything written down because you may tell me two, th two or three things and I've gotten to uh, number two and I have half of three, but I forgot what number one is. <laughs> those are the types of things that that uh, both of those can do. Just want to throw in there, people are saying in the comments that they've never seen an IEP to 504. I actually see it quite a bit, but only in districts that have high classification rates and are trying right. to lower them artificially. So you have kids that are like on that cusp and technically they are, you know, declassifying kids and showing how good they are. Um, and so you'll see pushes in some districts, specific districts where I work, where um, they try and push kids to 504s. 
Yeah. Um, I, if I were the parent and I knew that now there's times like my, my daughter got pulled off of speech for fourth grade and I had a conniption. She could have been, should have been pulled off of speech by first grade, but they liked me. They liked her. <laughs> I just didn't want her to lose anything. You know, it's like, I don't want her to lose it, but she was fine. You know, so you have to, you, and if the, the school is telling you we're going to move to a 504, as a parent, I'm going to push back and say, you need to show me why. And if I disagree with your with you saying why you have a parent as a parent have recourse, you can do an independent educational evaluation. Love those IEs. <laughs> that's how I, that's how, what I do. That's like uh, IE. um, so oh, yeah. Danielle said, uh, how can we help ensure that an IEP is being followed in times of virtual learning? This is a I feel like. Meeting. I feel like the, that that is the easier time because you're well. It depends on if you're home with a kid, I guess. Um, I during virtual learning, my my autistic daughter did virtual learning all year, and whereas my ADHD kid, I want to say we had to get rid of her. She just had to go into school. <laughs> she had to get out there and talk to her friends, and so we took a chance and let her go in for the second semester. But um, the it should be easier for virtual learning because you can pull out your IEP and see, oh, they're supposed to get two and a half hours of speech a week. And um, I just pulled up the Zoom schedule. And when when is Janie getting speech? Uh, does she only get it on Fridays? Well, we can't. Sit. I don't care what you can't do. We need to either change it in the IEP so that she's not getting it or we need to make sure that she has it. Um, they really one of the things that happened with COVID was the schools tried to be slick and they tried to put and I don't know what the, the schools are, you know, but they tried to in the CARES Act uh, that came back in March, they tried to put a clause in there that would allow them to delay services for up to 45 days. And um, Secretary of Education at the time uh, said, nope can't do that. There's no reason why we should delay any services because of COVID. And the federal government really has not stepped in allowing districts or any state to delay. So COVID is not an excuse. They also like, um, I don't know if you've seen this, Kim, but I've seen a lot of districts trying to pull, like getting people to, um, pressuring them to put in virtual learning like plans into the IEP. And I don't know what you advise, but I've been advised against it because it allows them to kind of, um, you know, temporarily like lessen services, but you know that you're not getting them back ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, uh, we have a virtual learning plan for my daughter, but that the first thing I said was, okay, so I, we're not changing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, well, I'm like, we're not, you're either going to, you know, we just say for virtual learning, she's going to get talk to her. Um, she has an autism specialist. She's going to talk to the autism specialist about her executive functioning issues online. And that's yep. what happened. Two words. So two words. Parent, yeah. Just watch what you're signing. Um, even if you're signing something, that doesn't mean it's not the be all end all. So it's not like you signed it and like, oh my gosh, I signed my child's away. Now she has to, you know, da -da. no, you still have recourse. Okay. So you might have signed something. Gosh, I signed the IEP. Now I can't. Yes, you can go back and say, well, I changed my mind. I don't like this. Now I want to do something else. So. Um, all right. Does a diagnosis from child find count or is it like a doctor diagnosis? Uh, count as what would be my example, my thing. So I wonder if they mean like for services in school. And yeah, it doesn't. When I say that you're going to get an educational classification, okay, I used to say diagnosis and then like I got slammed because schools that they don't like the, the first thing is says, we don't diagnose. Um, so if you go to school, you get an assessment through child find and they say this child meets the classification of autism, but you don't have a medical diagnosis yet, which happens because sometimes there's waiting lists and so on and so forth. Um, you cannot take that school diagnosis and say, oh, I'm going to go on to get all these therapies and get my insurance to pay for it now. And, and and now I need um, Adderall. And you can't take the school's uh, classification and say and use it as an official thing in order to get get services other than the school. Right. School for school, medical for medical. Correct. Um, Danielle says, is there a good online source to research accommodations we can ask for? I don't necessarily mind what the school suggested, but I'm just not sure what else I can ask for. Great question. 
Oh my gosh, that is a great question. Cause I had, oh my God, I, you know, I could sit here and tell stories all day. Next time I'll come back and I'll just be IEP stories. Um, I had some uh, a school tell a parent, and they never tell me. I just really want them to tell me one day. But you know, I am the IEP strategy. They don't say anything to me. But they they said you have used up all of the accommodations that are available. This is a school in Texas. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> There's no limit to the number. They of mean all of the ones on the right. drop down list and IEP direct <laughs> is what they mean by that. You have all of the ones that we provide. Sorry. Um, no, there is the, the a good online. There's a couple of good online resources. First, I, I really like understood.org. Um, just understood, understood.org. And I want you to sit down with your child if your child is able to communicate with you and really just like, look, this is talking, we're talking about relaxing time right before your favorite TV show. Y'all sitting on the couch and you're saying, hey, Kim. If you could have blank, 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 and it's and he, look, you got to tell ADHD kids, you cannot say nothing. You can't say a million dollars. You can't say the teacher has to fly off to Timbuktu. What do you think would get you a passing grade and such as a? And they might say, I just really feel like I need to have the book at home because I'm always forgetting it at school. Oh, okay. Um, books are different now. I don't know if they, but but for my daughter. I, I am like the queen of just asking for stuff. <laughs> so she we had a second set of books at home because I did not like that. they I didn't even know they had books, I think by for fifth grade or something. For, but she just has she reads very well, but her reading comprehension is poor. And so we would just get the worksheet because they went over, I don't know, the World War Two or whatever in class. And so she's answering the worksheet. And I'm just like, is there a book or something? And so I found out, got the book at home. And we would start from chapter one and read through it and, you know, not take forever, but just read through it. And so I had the, the book with me. Also, um, my autistic daughter had her own, I always like to like give uh, examples, but I don't have one, but she had her own box of pencils. And she would sit there and just chew on pencils. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I found out about this and we had, I had lovely teachers with her, but I found out and they're just like, you know, why don't we um, work with occupational therapy? They have these chewy necklaces and everything. You see that a lot of times with autism. And I was like, I don't want her chewing on something that's not food, you know, because <laughs> I was just going through this whole stuff. And I said, well, how about gum? And they looked at me with horror. They're just like, okay, you're going to let. And I said, well, this is what we'll do. We will provide her with a piece of gum in the morning. And she's pretty good with rule following. And then after lunch, she can have another piece of gum. And I said, but we will give the gum to you because I don't want her in charge of the gum <laughs> because my kid would be giving out gum to everybody. And so for, from kindergarten, I mean, from uh, second grade through fifth grade, she had gum. I love it. Um, my son's IEP is for autism. I suspect he also has SLD. The school says they don't need to test since he's already getting services. Um, my blood pressure cuff. <laughs> I, every time they say, I, I'm with you. I'm like, these schools, they just lie. They just make up stuff. I swear to God. Um, well, Robin, you're autistic. So that means that, you know, if you're dyslexic, we'll just cover that under the I mean, it's all the same, right? Like, come on. Um, I mean, go ahead, Kim. I'm <laughs> Lord have mercy. Okay, here's the thing. An IEP is individualized education program. People say plan. I don't yell at you, but, you know, if you're an advocate, you should say program because program is the correct term. Um, SLD, for those that don't under know what that is, a specific learning disability, and it covers things like dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, um, the way the brain processes um, language, words, so on and so forth. Um, also can, can cover some brain injuries. So when they say um, SLD, it can cover a variety of things. He does need to test. <laughs> and I'm glad you said SLD because a lot of times schools run in the opposite direction the minute you mention dyslexia. But he does need to test in order to determine whether or not the SLD is affecting his learning. Autism is a completely different set of symptoms. Completely. And so we want to know, and it's and it, it's almost uh, I hate to use the term, but it's almost ableist to to just lump all the well, you know, he's getting these services, so he or make it seem as if your child isn't uh, worthy or deserving of having those disabilities differentiated. 
Um, Kim, do, is I don't know if this is true. In every state, do they, like in my state, I know SLD, they do the discrepancy model, which is like the discrepancy between, right? So do they do, in this, is that every state that does that? I'm, no, as a matter of fact, if you're, you're, you're in Washington. Jersey. New Jersey. Why, why don't they do that in Washington? Oh, because you're the, the other folks. Are, you have folks all over the place. Um, I have to look that up because I there so many starts are moving away from that. So discrepancy model would be a child is uh, there's a huge in order to be qualified for an SLD, the child has to have a huge discrepancy in their regular grades in school and their IQ test, which is what the school psychologist says. And typically it will show that their regular grades in school, they're having they're getting C's, but their IQ is average to above average. And their IQ is showing that, wow, this real this kid really should be doing way better. And so we should look at an SLD. No, <laughs> there is no, there are a million studies out now that are showing that there isn't always a discrepancy between a child's IQ and whether or not they have um, a specific learning disorder. So what schools just need to do is go, there are a lot of the, your typical school psychologists have the training to be able to suss this out. And you also have recourse. If you think that they are wrong, you can get an independent educational evaluation. Um, ideas, uh, I don't want to miss that out, Claire. Ideas on how to get additional testing after that initial evaluation, you're going to go through and send a formal letter serious and use one of those terms I threw in there like FAPE or whatever. I'm afraid he's getting denied a FAPE because he may have, um, and I don't typically, I typically will tell a parent if you don't have a diagnosis or you do have an autism diagnosis, but you don't have an SLD diagnosis, I'll just tell you to go Google those symptoms. So go on understood.org, symptoms of an SLD, and start picking off the ones that apply to your kid and put that, you know, I'm afraid that he's, um, typical dyslexia stuff. He's reading, you know, two grades below the the lexile levels or whatever, um, according to the teacher, because we don't know what lexile levels are, because you're not expected to know those things as a, <laughs> as a parent. But or, you know, he's turning his letters backwards and he's uh, in fourth grade and they probably shouldn't be doing that. So those are the types of things that I would say I would list those things. And then a school psychologist can pick up on, wow, these are all symptoms that would would trigger me to look at um, specific learning disorders. Disorder. Also, Claire, there is a clause in the idea that says, even though when they're doing a test for your child, they are supposed to be testing for disabilities that don't necessarily fall into the category of what you are saying. They are supposed to be looking for everything. So you can throw that out there too. Hey, Beth. Hey, Beth. Beth always has <laughs> great questions. Beth is a, a, a I'll teach MVP. Um, should a speech and OT be sending home something weekly of what they do? Um, I only get a graph three times a year. Very common. Should they? It would be wonderful if they did. Uh, are they required by law? No. The law requires that the IEP team, all the people that are working with your kid, provide a progress report a certain number of times a year. And the idea gives an example notices is it's an example of quarterly meaning every time your child gets a their report card they also get a progress report that says how they're doing on their goals if you are me you are talking to those speech and ot people every couple of weeks <laughs> which is what i did when my daughter was younger I'm like so how's she doing and what i what i tried to do um, and I really, you know, I, I tried my best to, I still use this tactic. Uh, as an advocate, I'm a little bit harsher because I get mad at what parents tell me the schools are doing. But with my own kids, I am catching flies with as much honey as possible until I get mad. And I've only been mad a handful of times, but I really want them to know that I'm doing whatever I can to work with them, which for me, um, for that speech and OT person, I would be asking them, okay, well, can you show me what you're working on with Kim? Um, can I come in and maybe meet with you or we do a Zoom meeting or whatever so I can try this at home? And then I just might, you know, send them, shoot them an email every couple of weeks or so. And I wouldn't do them both at the same time. Maybe do speech one week, one week and then OT the other week and say, we tried doing the 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 pronunciation pronunciation of the S's the same way you did it. And have you noticed a difference? You know, that kind of thing. And then they'll be excited to to report to you. You can also put it in the in the IEP weekly communication log as an accommodation, especially for the people listening, because a lot of people that are listening pro have non-speaking kids. Mm -hmm. And so they're not getting a report from their kids. And so oh, that is another one because my daughter was, um, 
nonverbal going into uh, preschool. And I was, I just, I was like, well, did she use the bathroom? I'm like, I'm, what did she do? <laughs> the teacher was just like, I said, well, can I just have like a daily report of something? No, if I do that, I'm going to have to do that for, for all of the, ch there was eight kids. I'm going to have to do that for all of the children. And how about I created a form for her because yep. I was like, okay. And this was like, before I knew anything about the idea, I created a form for her. And I'm like, you don't have to write anything down. All you have to do is circle peed today, poop, you know, <laughs> right. you know, smile, that kind of thing. Those are all of the things that I needed to know because it, it's, it's scary to have your ch child not be able to tell you what is happening in school. And for the teachers that are watching that, do not let your chi the child, uh, the news of your child getting hurt, anything, come out of your child's mouth before it comes out of your mouth. Oh I, like, that's like a, a thing for me. If I don't get a phone call, if my kid comes home hurt, even if it's a band-aid on her knee, I just want to yep. know like what happened yep. because you know, our kids can't communicate like clearly. And, and so then, now that you've said that, you know, you have a lot of people online that are whose kids are um, nonverbal or preverbal you absolutely want to put in that IEP that that child that you are getting more than three times a year, a graph. I want words. I want to be able to talk to them, but I also want those people to feel like I'm working with them. Yeah. Um, and that I'm, you know, I, I really try to go in there and overkill like with lo lots of kindness and love. And then the one or two times that I'm irritated, then they really pay attention. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, just this, it's not much I think people want. They just want to know if there's anything major, like, right. you know, that somebody said on TikTok, actually, can you ask her if it's the OT's only job to help with handwriting? <laughs> I hear this question a lot. There are, in my opinion, there are two type of OTs, the cool kind and the handwriting kind. Oh, um, yeah. No, but, occupational therapist. Oh my gosh. Occupational therapist. A lot of people don't know what an occupational therapist does. No. Anytime I sit in an IEP meeting and an occupational therapist comes in, I will ask her, it's usually a her, to list all of the things that they do. But um, one of the things that occupational therapists can work with ADHD kids on executive functioning issues. And I am like all over them with that, like helping your kids to um, develop their uh sense of time management, um, all of these things that, that our ADHD and autistic kids have problems with that's in that prefrontal cortex to help that brain elasticity in doing those exercises. But most of the time when we think about um, OT, we only think about small motor, gross motor. They're helping this child go up and down the stairs. They're helping with pencil grip. They're, you know, you'll see a report that talks about just the physical aspect of occupational therapy and they can do so much more. So no, not just writing pencil. No, they can Ooh, do. I got to read. Yeah. Ooh. So my <laughs> seven-year-old son has multiple disabilities and high anxiety, sensory processing disorder, and also the doctor told me that he is autistic. He's scheduled to have his IEP evaluation in California, but with COVID and his high anxiety and separation anxiety, possible ADHD, no treatment for anything yet. He hates school. How can he be evaluated? Um, I'm looking into virtual school too, but he needs the IEP first. Please advise. Uh, okay. Uh, my, that my book's not going to help you. My book is usually for, <laughs> I'll be honest. My book is like, once you get, once you have the IEP, um, but I am writing some more. First of all, um, I'm irritated because they have not done all of, all of these diagnoses. I'm going to assume that he has been in school and they have, they, they're in violation of child fine. It does not surprise me because this is California. Um, California, as lovely as the state is, I have more headaches from my clients in California than anywhere else. Um, a child can be evaluated whether they can speak, whether they can see. There are so many different tests that the that can be given. So they may not actually be working with him in terms of having him sit down and like write down answers. That's not something that you need to worry about. What I see at this age and at this level of disability, they are asking you questions. So you and his dad or someone that knows him or his teacher, they have what they call these inventories. And so they say, well, how many times does um, your child do, do this? And you'll say several times a day or whatever. And they will compile 
what the, the people that know him most that have answered these questions to come up with where his um, deficits are and what they need to do to help. But at this age, if he's not the type of kid, like a, my kid, at there were certain ages that she was not, her anxiety was ridiculous. She was not sitting down and sitting there and answering anybody's questions. So they would observe. And so they would just observe the child. And that is telling as well for a psychologist to explain, hey, this one of the goals for this child is to be able to decrease the anxiety or is it anxiety or is it ADHD? Is it, you know, the hyperactivity? We've got to figure out what it is that is causing this child not to be able to have a traditional evaluation. But at seven, they're not doing um too much. <laughs> they may, if the child is verbal and can sit, they may ask them, they show them some pictures. Okay. What does the cow do? You know, they may, if the kid can't answer, then I don't know, you know, then, then that will be something that they would do, but I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, just to throw in there, I do evaluations. And so one of the strategies I use, especially with anxious kids, as I observe them before they know who I am first, mm -hmm. Um, and so I will, you know, and then the teacher just says, basically, you know, they're observing me or, you know, whatever it is. And I sit in the back unobtrusive. They have no idea who I am. They have no idea I'm observing them. Um, right. and so I get a more accurate read and it's also not setting off the kid's anxiety that I'm there to watch them. Um, cause and some kids get anxious and other English. kids will be like, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm My daughter needed to, uh, needed to know who the substitutes were in the building. She didn't want to be surprised. So every morning she would go to the office and look to see who was who was substituting for who. So she wasn't walking past a classroom and seeing Robin instead of, you know, Miss Johnson. Um, you also, by the way, uh, by law, the school has to provide a translator for you. Um, in, if you are more comfortable, if your son is more comfortable hearing, um, and I'm going to make a leap and assume it's Spanish, um, then they need to do the testing in Spanish. If you're, uh, if you are more comfortable hearing the interpretation in Spanish, then they have to provide a uh, translator for you. Um, let me see if I'm missing anything. Any other questions? Um, this is a great question. I would probably end here, and then um, maybe we'll just do like a rapid fire. Uh, Top, <laughs> top things to look out for, or top IEP advice. Or something. I love this one. As a SPED teacher, how do I approach working with parents? The, the hands down, best SPED teacher I've ever had was, and my that my daughter loved as well. Got ahead of me. You have those parents that are, um, now you, and you'll know uh, the parents that are like me that are like, I want to know every little thing. What is that you just drank, Robin? How many sips did you take? And then, you know, um, she got ahead of me. She got my cell phone number. Uh, she was not afraid of me, you know, and I, I didn't abuse it or anything like that, but she would send me, like, I would be afraid my, my daughter's going on the field trip and this is the one, you know, I'm, I'm kind of letting go. I'm going to let, I'm not going to chaperone this time. And she would send me pictures just to make me feel like she's doing something well, or she would send me maybe a text every couple of weeks. And so, Hey, you know, Tessa did you know, she, the funniest thing happened today. Tessa, and it was just making me feel like, wow, she is really picking up on my anxieties and making me feel like she's loving. And she would just tell me good things about my kid. Now my kid did plenty of things that were not good, <laughs> but she would like every once in a while, oh yeah, you know, she was, she said to me, uh, Miss McNeely, you, you know, you need to have two more kids or whatever. She would just send me these funny little anecdotes and I absolutely loved it. And I felt like I could approach her. I love getting like when I send you like a little dojo message and like something cute they did. Like yeah. I just love it. Because um, I was a parent that, you know, our school district had a 355 number. So anytime 355 came up, I had a nervous breakdown. My kid also has allergies. So I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, something's wrong. And I was just so used to that, that to get these little messages from her when they were just like, nothing's nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. I just want to tell you that she, she made a, com a funny comment about cheese. <laughs> I, I think that's such an important point that, like, how many like like parents like us, right? When we hear from the school, it's usually for something bad. It's usually yeah. come get your kid. It's usually you know there was an issue. She's sick and the nurse. It's like it's yeah. we don't she's that, and we sit in meetings where we have to be read reports of every single one of our kids' deficits, right? And it, 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 we don't get a lot of positive messages right. about our children. And so mm -hmm. when teachers go above and beyond to just you know. 
like show how well taken care of they are, that you see something like funny or cute that they did. Um, you know, it's just goes a long way to like feel yeah. like you trust your child with this person because they are taking good care of them. And it's just not c constant negativity. Um, right. And I try to, I mean, with every client that I have, and a lot of times, again, I get them when they're mad. I really bend over backwards for my special ed teachers. I'm just like, first of all, to choose that profession, you know, you have to, they, they, you're gold. You're not choosing. And there's a lot. My, my mother was a teacher. I have taught. No one is running to become a teacher nowadays. You know, there's a lot of thanklessness to the job and everything. And so I try to get the parents back on and even kill and say, okay, wait a minute. This person chose this specialty because they either have someone with special needs in their family um, with a disability. They have some or they, you know, have a pension for it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's try to, you know, or, or they know something and they, you know, there's something going on with the school and you want to blame the teacher. And a lot of times I'll be like, mm, the teacher knows, but they can't say anything. I sit in so many meetings where I'm looking at the teacher and they're looking yeah. at me and I'm like, I know that she's on the same page as me <laughs> and I'm going to help her out right now. And I'm going to say it. Um, right. The, um, the other thing I wanted to, like you made me think of, is that a lot of times being on the teacher side, I've been on both sides of it. I was a teacher before I was a parent. Um, and when I first started, there's a, a tendency among teachers, especially special education teachers, to kind of blame the parents for things or say, oh, it would be better if they were more strict at home or like they just give in to them at home. We can't actually do anything because, you know, they don't, uh, you know, follow up at home and like, all this kind of stuff. And a lot of, um, especially like for like, you know, young teachers who don't have children, or if you're working yeah. in a school that's like a different demographic than you are, um, right. there can There's be a, a lot of barrier. uh, cultural barriers and assumptions mm -hmm. about people's parenting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as a young teacher, that's one of the most damaging things that you can do is to read parents with suspicion and judgment. Um, you have to assume that all parents are doing the best that they possibly can. Um, and unless there's like, you know, neglect or abuse, um, right. parents are doing the best that they can. And, you know, it's not, um, it's not as easy. I was a perfect parent before I had children. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I used to watch Super Nanny and I would be like, I would never. And then my kids came along and I'm like, Super Nanny, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the whole changed. leash thing now people are like oh. flipping out about the leash and i'm like listen yeah. i used to be one of those people i would never i would never honey that leash came out probably when my youngest was three months um one of the things i wanted to, to add the idea requires um that parent that parents are allowed to have training so if you have a child that had that is autistic you know and you are uh that child is in kindergarten, they got their diagnosis in kindergarten. And as a parent, okay, you're an expert on your child, but you may not understand like what's autism, what's ADHD, what's, you know, what's all these things you can just request or as a special um, education teacher, just pull up some of the, and you may not know, cause you know, you're busy with your school, but if you just go into your, on your school district website, you can see they have all types of uh, webinars. They have to provide legally training for parents. Now that doesn't mean coming into your house and sitting you down and saying, okay, this is what you do. But that means that they offer it um, on a school district basis. Sometimes they will do specialized training if you have like a device or something that you need training on. But there are a couple of clients of mine whose kids have severe emotional uh, disturbances and they, the parent just, you know, it's not, it's not a reflective of reflection on the parenting at all. It is just a issue with the child's um, genetic makeup and things like that. And so the parent really is at their wits end and the school, uh, we, I went to explain to the parent, look, this is available. I had no idea that this was here. This is how, you know, you, you learn about trauma and things like that. And the schools, um, the school teachers didn't know that it existed. And it was like, okay, you have this. <laughs> Sometimes you just go on the website and just spend a couple days and a uh, couple hours just looking through and seeing the stuff that they have available. Love it. So Kim, we're, uh, it's 9.08 now. So I knew we would go over. I was like, we have yeah, I told you. I could talk to you forever. I like just like, share <laughs> horror stories from sitting at IEP tables, oh, like the wacky stuff that school cited parents. Um, and it's not the teachers, it's the administrators. It's usually. not, it is not. I have, I. I, I want to say there, uh, of my kids, she's going into 10th grade now. 
third, the preschool. So it was like 3K and sixth grade where the years where I was looking at those teachers with the side eye, like, <laughs> Are you like what is going on? But for the majority, it really was not. I still, I want to say there's maybe of those teachers, two of them probably were, had issues. Everybody else was just overworked or just didn't understand the law or didn't understand the disability. And so me having that compassion and working with them was really all that was necessary. So if you had to give your closing a uh, piece of advice or, you know, tell people where to find you and then um, we can, we can end it there. <sighs> I have no idea. No. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I am, so if you go to um, the IEP strategist on uh, Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, TikTok is where I do all these little silly videos. And I told Robin I wasn't going to show, but my, my wigs are over here. I, I put wigs on that are. <laughs> I have a wig now too, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I handle IEPs and 504s and school meetings in, in all 50 states. And um I have been doing that for as long as possible. If you would like to have a consultation with me, just go to my website and you can schedule it and I'll be more than happy to help. It is a passion of mine. Um, I do not charge enough, which is people tell me that all the time, but it is what it is. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll yes, all better book, You better all better book her before she gets wise. I just, I really, I, people tell me, oh my gosh, I thought, you know, but I, it's a passion and I do a deep dive. And so if, and then I also have ethics, I'm not going to, if I feel like there's nothing I can do, like, I'm not going to help you or I'll, I will do what I can. And I'm like, I'm not charging you. Cause there's, you know, you got bigger issues. Or the worst thing you can be in this field is, is that get the reputation of being a hired gun. I got that advice very early on and they were like, oh, listen, wow. don't sell out. Like you can't, if you evaluate a kid, if it, even if it's not what the parents want to hear, you've got to just be honest because. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's times where I'm like, I, I, you've done everything possible. I'm gonna, you, you need an attorney. Now I'll help you find an attorney, but I'm not gonna charge you for it. I will find an attorney for you that's gonna, not gonna cost a lot. That goes through this organization that I trust, and you know that kind of thing. But for the most part, I just as a parent, I want you. Um, if again, and if you're not even thinking about doing an advocate, probably or getting an advocate, and you just want to know more about the process, pull up your state's procedural safeguards. Just type in the, your state and then procedural safeguards. Print them out and look at them. Um, if they are less than 30 pages, then you probably want to look up your state's uh, special education laws because they only have to. Some states only give you the bare minimum, which is what to do if there's a problem like due process. But you really want to know, like, how many days do I have from the time that I ask for an IEP meeting to the time that they have to do it? Does my school have does my district and it doesn't go by district, it goes by state. So whether you're in San Diego or you're in LA, the laws are going to be the same by the, I mean, they're going to be the same by the state. If you're looking at the idea, the federal law, it covers all of the states. Anytime you see a number in the idea, so 15 days or uh, age three or whatever, that's when you want to look at your state because the idea gives your state the leeway to change that a little bit. So in my state, uh, the idea says 60 days from the time that I request an initial evaluation until I, the time I have the evaluation in my hand. But in my state, it's 90 days. In Michigan, it's 30 days. So those are the types of things. So anytime you see a number in the idea, go to your state's procedural safeguards. So those are the couple things that I would I would leave you guys with. Mine, mine is that, um, that your child's needs determine their program, not what the school has, what the school likes, what the school prefers, <laughs> um, who they hire, what seats they have open, the color, you know. And it's yeah. None of matter. that. Yeah, they, they cannot tell you, oh, you know what? We don't have that program anymore. You know, we used to have five kids with Tourette's, and when the last one left, we got rid of our specialist. So sorry, we can't help you. Guess what? You got to hire somebody. You got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot tell. There, there is legal precedent where the school cannot tell you we cannot pay for that or we cannot provide that. Your, the child's needs are, are determined what is provided, and that's, you yeah, know, not the other way around. Wrong. Um, I'm sorry, no. we don't have an autism program here. Well, you better find one. <laughs> you better make one or find one. Um, <laughs> I say it a lot in meetings. 
anyway, I'm going to end it here. Uh, Kim, if you, uh, you don't have to go. It'll just end the broadcast and then we'll, uh, I'll, you know, say home, you you get the, privately. Get the um, <laughs> all right. Bye everyone. Thanks guys. Hold on one second. End the broadcast. <laughs>